quite obvious. I'm not Pastor Bob. <laughs> I opened up a folder at home and I had literally hundreds and hundreds of notes for all kinds of stuff. And then I decided not to use any of them. That's strange. This is supposed to be kind of like a fireside chat, but we don't have any fire. And the lights are pretty bright, so forget that. God does work clearly in strange and, materi- in strange and mysterious ways. Keep that in mind. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. And you maybe wouldn't either. <laughs> so, <clears throat> what I decided to do is tell a little bit of my story. Some of you have heard it, but it's not about me. Well, it is, I guess. I can't get away from that. It is about me. Uh, I grew up in a good church, a free church, evangelical free church in Wolverton, Minnesota. Uh, farm kid to start out, then we moved to town, then I ended up on a farm and farmed again. But anyway, <clears throat> that's part of the story. Uh, I got good preaching, good teaching along the way, good preachers. I've never been in a church that had bad preachers. And if you've been around here very long, I don't think you've been in bad church with bad preachers either. That's very important. So anyway, that's part of the story. Uh, in vacation Bible school, about I was about 12 years old, I decided to become a believer. That's very important, to decide to become a believer. Just so you know, most of you do. You've got to start with God. If you don't start with God, you haven't started with God. I mean, it's, I guess, logical. Um, i got to tell you, too, before I get too far into this, that I am a conversationalist. I talk to people and with people, and some of you even know that I meet regularly with people for coffee. That's not all bad. I like the coffee. And the people are okay, too. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't keep coming back. But uh, I became a Christian. Uh, a verse that I think about often, Second Corinthians 6, 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. That Bible school theme was you got to make a decision sometime. you got to decide for God. Now, timing, timing is very important. The earlier you do that, the better it is, because then you've got a whole life to live for God or with God. Makes sense. I try to be practical about things, too. Uh, but when I got to be a junior high guy, I was very, very shy. Terribly shy. I didn't dare get up before a youth group and say anything. It scared the life out of me. In fact, you can lose sleep over something like that. You know what I'm talking about? So I, I was very shy. And I went to high school the same way, got to looking at girls, and whew, that was a real problem. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, this is too personal, but I'll share it anyway, because it does reflect a little. There was this gal that sat across from me. She was really a sharp, nice gal, and I was interested. And one day in my English class, I was sitting there looking across, but I developed a, one of those big red things on the end of your nose. And sometimes you attack them, try to make, <laughs> make them better, and they get worse. You know how that goes. I, I worked on it, and it got worse. The bad part of that was that the week before on Friday night basketball games, and back in the day, 59, 58, 59, that's, that's way back, there was a certain protocol to how you got connected with girls. You went to a basketball game, and then somebody would kind of say, hey, have you got a ride home? I don't know why there were so many girls there that didn't have rides home. <laughs> <laughs> and I was too scared to ask, but my friend said, hey, Jim would like to take you home. And they even had the car. I was riding with somebody else, so they... It was, it was rigged, the whole thing. But that happened Friday night, the ball game. I don't know if we won or lost, but anyway. By the way, I went to Breckenridge High School, so actually I am a cowboy at heart. <laughs> but I have been converted. 
So now I am a Viking. <laughs> Not those purple guys either. Uh, so I came back to school and she was there and I didn't dare say hello. So I sat and through English class. <laughs> and that's as far as it ever went. That was the end of it. God worked in strange, mysterious, mysterious ways. Otherwise, I could have gotten to liking her. I, would have, I, would have, I wouldn't be here. I can tell you that. So, anyway, I got to college, and I... That was, a, that was an interesting story of how I ended up in college rather than a trade school, WAP Science, where I had signed up. But I got to college, and I got to my sophomore year, and my advisor said to me, you know, you ought to take a speech class. I looked at him, and I said... I didn't say you're crazy, but I said, not in my life <laughs> would I ever take a speech class. And he said, well, you can put it off. It's, you ought to take it now. It's part of general studies. It'd be good. Yeah, I know it's good. You don't have to tell me that. But I said, no way. Came to my winter quarter, and he nagged me again. He said, you know, you ought to take this now and get these general studies behind you. And I finally decided, I prayed about it, I said, Lord, if you're going to push me into this speech class, I guess I'll, push comes to shove, I'll have to do it, which I did. I made a deal with God, I said, if you help me get through this one, maybe I'll get over this stuff. Maybe. But it's worth a shot at it. So I ended up in speech class, and I got along quite well, believe it or not. And that was the beginning of changing around. I, I got to be a social creature, <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> so, sorry, I offer no apologies because God is behind us all this stuff. So blame Him. And I, I have no idea why Pastor Bob is laying in his bed as I speak, other than God works in strange, mysterious ways. So, well, I got through that speech class, and then I was in a university, and they elected me treasurer because I was taking business classes. So, you know, that's kind of a fit. So I got to be a treasurer of university Christian fellowship on campus, and that was a good move. It really wasn't about money, because we didn't have much. We, we took a little collection. We gave a speaker a little honorarium once in a while and so forth. I could handle that. But then, when I got to be a junior, they elected me president of university. Now I had to get up in front. And somehow, I had to do that. Well, somehow I did it, with God's help, God's grace. I don't have any other answers for all this. That's the way it is. So, that was a very good experience, and I even got friends here. And some of you have been in university people. I think we got quite a few in here who have been in, through in, in university or Campus Crusade or, or Navigators or something on campus. They're very good organizations. And I would encourage you young people, if you go to college, get hooked up with one of those organizations and spend time there. That's a big part of your educational experience. Maybe the most important, no matter how you cut it. So anyway, uh, that experience. Then... I went to, inter to the University uh, Urbana Missions Conference. And on the streets of, I was just walking down the street in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and this gal was walking alongside me, and I think she said hi first. I kind of blame it on her. She said hi, and I said hi, and where are you from? I'm from Minnesota. She said, I'm from Minnesota. And there you go. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> there's a long story in between. Um, godly, mysterious intervention stuff. I could tell you more about that. So, that was in uh, 1964, 65, somewhere in there, and then we eventually got married. And then we were in our house in Pelican, no, in Moorhead. We were in a more ed By the way, I became a teacher where I was and, am, and was for my life in front of people. Who would have thunk? Unbelievable. See, that's the God part. It's not about me. So, in fact, I went to my 
reunion. I don't know, the 80th or 90th high school reunion. <laughs> I can't even find the town anymore. <laughs> I got there and I, I said something about uh, reunions and stuff. and I don't know, I just couldn't remember. But anyway, I can't remember what I was going to say about that. Okay, here we are. A guy came to our door, knocked on the door and said, you know what? There's a group in Pelican Rapids that are meeting, kind of a Bible study. There's four couples and their kids, and they're meeting down here, and they're thinking about maybe eventually forming a church. Okay? So, that was Merv Seashore, our district superintendent. <clears throat> and in the meantime, I had been involved in InterVarsity with, we went out to different churches, and we put on programs, youth deals on a Saturday night. We'd stay over, we'd have a choir, we'd have some singing, a quartet maybe, and we had a lot of musical talent, and, and I ended up speaking at a few of those. And later, some of the pastors of those churches called me back in the summer when they, they were on vacation and said, could you fill the pulpit? I never did know what filling a pulpit was. I just stood there, I guess. <laughs> So I got filling the pulpit, and that's how they knew that I was filling the pulpits of free churches. And he said, could you go down and meet with those people, you know, on a Sunday morning? Because we started having some little kind of a service thing in the houses in the basement or wherever. And share a little bit, and, and yeah, I could try that. It was September 1972. And so we did, my wife and I, and we had a couple little shavers and put them in the car and took them down, and we met, and shared a few things, and then he came back about two, a week or two later, and he said, I don't know if you knew if you were, that you were candidating, but you were. <laughs> and they would like you to come back, and, you know, if you could do that for, a, you know, a little while and help him kind of get established and started, because he was driving up to, from the cities and back on the weekends, and that was getting kind of hard, because he was district superintendent and stuff. So they, he said, do you suppose you could commute down there and, and meet Sunday mornings, but maybe Wednesday night and have a little Bible study, you know? And Well, we agreed to do that for a year. And seven years later, I finally said, you know, I think you guys are grown up now enough so you can have a full-time preacher. And he was here last week or two weeks back, Pastor John White. So... I finally resigned and said, you've got to get a real guy in the pulpit. And he was a real guy. And then we got another real guy. But it's another story. In the meantime, I guess I would say, I, had the, I got stretched. Here was this kid that couldn't stand up in front of a youth group. And now we went out and we started knocking on doors. I remember knocking on doors... One of the couples in the, that group was, well, a couple of them, I think, were part of the welcoming committee for Pelican Rapids. And they knew when new people were moving to town. So when we come down on Wednesday night, they had names of people and addresses. Here, go see them. <laughs> so we knocked on doors. And that was quite an experience. I can remember people, we knocked on the door. and I was, I'm a layman. I've never had a class of preaching, teaching, or whatever from Bible school or whatever. So I'd, I'm just a guy off the street. But I knocked on the door and I said, I'm the pastor of the newly formed free church in Pelican Rapids. And you should have seen some of them scramble. They had to get their tables cleaned up and they had, oh, ooh, ooh, a preacher is here. Got to shape up, I guess. Well, I didn't command that much respect, I guess. It looked like they did, I guess. I didn't have any cloth or anything on. But <clears throat> that was a stretching experience. Why do I tell you this? Not because I want to go public, but I think you have to know that God <clears throat> sometimes changes us. In fact, he always changes us. In fact, we're changing whether we know it or not or whether we do it with God or without God. That's the way he works. But if you get in touch with him, all of a sudden, you're in a closer connection. And by the way, I was reading, and I got a little, what they call a study Bible, a leadership Bible. 
It's got loads of notes. If you haven't got one, you're in leadership position anywhere, you ought to get one of these Bibles, leadership Bible. It has all kinds of notes on leadership. And one of the things I've carried out of that book, and I read it this week in, from Ephesians and Colossians, says this, leadership is relationship. Relationship is everything. If you don't have relationships outside of the church, the mission of the church is introverted and nothing will happen evangelistically. It doesn't happen without relationships. <clears throat> now, I know the media, I know that we can stream stuff all over the world and we do and we are, and for you people out there in television land or whatever it is, hi. Wherever this goes, but relationship is everything. I really feel that the church, from now on in, more than ever before, is going to be built on relationships. We have relationships with the world. Problem is, you get out there in that really cruel, nasty world where Satan lives and works, and we're going to get ripped to shreds. We are getting ripped to shreds as a church as an evangelical community. <clears throat> the, the good graces of the evangelical world, they tell me, was basically peaked out in the 90s. And the church and the reputation and the image and everything else, Satan has ripped to shreds, and it doesn't exist like it did. The great age of evangelism and so forth, the Billy Graham days, the outreach days, those days have changed. And we will either... <clears throat> reach the world through relationships or we won't. Now you can send the message but people are going to say it's kind of like Best Buy, if I can use the example. You can go online and you can search all you want. You can find a thousand products that Best Buy has but you know what? You want to get in there and handle that product or look at it. You want to touch it. You want to see how it really works. I think the church is like that. They want to come in, and they want to see some authentic, I guess examples, authentic us. If we're not authentically believers, you know, we kind of do what we say. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever not done what you said? Duh, don't do that. But it happens all the time. We drop witness that doesn't really go very far. It's our job to be examples. There's a song I think about. We don't <clears throat> use the old hymnals, but I love to tell the story. And the story is of God and change and beginning with him, walking with him, being discipled, growing, teaching, sharing. Pastor Bob has been saying that. And the way it happens is because God gets into us and then we get concerned. You know, we talk about missions sometimes. I'm watching the clock. I don't know if a pastor sees that clock or not. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> well, he's maybe watching the streaming stuff. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw it out there. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's okay. Now, she's going to go home and say, Did you, were you watching? <laughs> No, it's okay. We can go till 10.30, quarter to 11. I got a lot more material. No, I don't. <laughs> the truth of the matter is we do carry witness, whether we want to or like to or understand or not. And I guess I'd have to comment on Pelican Rapids a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm a different dude when it comes to the community here. And I, a lot of people, I don't think, understand me in this. And I, I, I'll throw this out for what it's worth. We've got a lot of foreigners living in Pelican Rapids, but they're not foreigners anymore. They're neighbors now. They're not foreigners anymore. They used to be, but not or not. They live in Pelican Rapids. They're citizens of Pelican Rapids, most of which are citizens of our country, some of which are new people here on work permits or green cards or whatever that process is. But they're here. I don't know if you know, but there are... <coughs> close to 400 Somali people living in Pelican Rapids. Did you know that? Now that's quite a presence. 
I would guess that there must be 600 or so uh, people from south of the border, Latin, Latinos. That's a lot of people living in Pelican Rapids that are new immigrants. Now, I really feel strongly that they are part of the community for a reason relative to our church. Yeah, there's all kinds of economic reasons. They're here because they found jobs. There's good work here for people that can't speak English or whatever. Places to have a plant like the turkey plant. You can get a job without knowing the language. And you can gradually learn it. But here's the point. They're here. Now, I have Somalis living in my rental house. And you know what? They're not just tenants. They're friends. I tell people they're nice guys. And they look at me like I'm crazy. Don't you know they're out to get me? No, they're not. Not me. I said one time, I'm going to be nice to them in the meantime. <laughs> That's a bad joke. <laughs> really bad joke. No, I think we are called as Christians to honor God's created beings, whoever they are, wherever they came from, where, however they got here. You Maybe you don't like the process, you maybe don't like the system, you don't like the factor here or whatever. Yeah, I, I'd say there's all kinds of issues out there in terms of attitudes and values and so forth. And we're a little bit pristine and we're a little bit self-centered on we want it the way we want it. And, but they're a mission field. And I'm going to leave it at that. I think you either feel called to that mission field or you don't recognize that. And I'm not arguing with that. If you're not called to to evangelize a certain group. It's just like going overseas. You are called to somebody in the Congo or you're called to Brazil or Madagascar or wherever. That's your calling. That's where you go to serve. If you don't feel called to serve in Pelican Rapids to reach any other group of people or even a coffee group in the morning or whatever, or a women's Bible study, wherever you're called to serve, that's where we're called. That's our mission. Now, I guess I'd have to sum this up and say, if I hadn't made a decision when I was 12 years old, I wouldn't be here. And I don't know what would be here if I wouldn't be here. Now, that there might have been a church, but it would have been a different church and a different group of people, and whatever doors I knocked on or somebody else knocked on, it would have been different. But here we are. Isn't God a wonderful, mysteriously gracious God? Wow. No, we don't say wow. We, we used to say amen when it was proper. Amen. So, God is good. I tell you all this because it's important that God works with people. I'm just one of those, and you are all of those, wherever you are. An old saying I picked up somewhere along the trail, bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. And God has a lot to do with where you're planted. So follow up on that.